let's uh, start with the four realms of existence. And maybe I should just ask you, I mean, before we dive into each one specifically, what the four are uh, quite broadly and what the theory is. Uh, You know, it's not a theory. Uh, The publisher kind of insisted in putting the word theory in the title. I wanted framework or something like that. So that's too boring. (laughs) Uh, So I, I don't, I don't, first of all, I just don't, necessarily think it's a theory. It's a kind of more of a a framework where I've assembled a lot of information. I mean, the book started with my um, feeling that ideas like self and personality were getting in the way of a lot of progress uh, in the field that, you know, if we, there's so much controversy about what the self is and, you know, personality has also been questioned. You know, there, you can look up quotes from people about these two and you'll find a bunch of people that say that they're illusions, they're made up, they're not real. And I certainly feel that about that, uh, about, about self, that it is, there's no additional thing besides you in you that is you. There's no other thing that we call a self that lives in you. Now, some people talk about self as a kind of agent in you, but I I just don't think that's valuable. Um, You are the one that's doing what you do. The only like account of self that I um, like or, you know, sort of adhere to is the self. I don't know if you can see my shirt. Each, every time I make a, I have a book lately, I make a t-shirt and this one is, yourself is a story. The other one was, the last book was um, no self, no fear but uh, this is yourself as the stories. So it's a narrative that you generate about yourself that helps you understand yourself. I, this is a divergence, but it goes back to, the, all this goes back to um, the work I did as a graduate student uh, uh, with Mike Sanaga on split brain patients. Uh, can I talk about that a minute and then we'll come please, back to the four Please, rooms. I mean, that's endless. Maybe endless we run out of time. <laughs> so uh, in graduate school, I had two degrees in marketing start this sort of starters and um, I didn't like really what I was doing uh, so I started taking psych courses and ended up taking a course with a guy who was studying the brain in rats this was at uh, Louisiana State University in the late 60s and he um, I, I so that was the first time I really had the idea that you could actually study the brain I, you know I didn't know anything about it coming from a small town in Louisiana and uh, so I decided that's what I wanted to do. And so I applied to a bunch of graduate schools and I got in at Stony Brook where I met Mike Kasanica. Um, It was a time when, you know, you didn't, I had no training at all, really no scientific training, no courses in science or anything like that, except a little bit of psychology. Um, but it was a time when you didn't have to know that much because neuroscience was brand new and they were looking for students. So I was able to slip in at that time. Uh, but we were studying split brain patients, which were fascinating. These are people, that have epilepsy so bad that at the time the medications weren't helping. So uh, surgically you could separate the two hemispheres and that would somehow ameliorate some of the uh, uh, convulsions that resulted when the seizures jumped back and forth between the hemispheres. So um, the thing about split brain patients is that the left hemisphere with language can talk to you, but the right hemisphere with not much language can't do that. Um, so you don't really know too much about what's going on in the right hemisphere, but I just want to tell you about one experiment. So we flashed on the screen two stimuli simultaneously. In the left visual field was a picture of a snow scene. This all this took place in uh, the hills of Vermont because uh, the surgeon was at Dartmouth at the time. So you got a snow scene on the left and a chicken claw on the right. So the left side of space goes to the right hemisphere, right side of space goes to the left hemisphere. So the hands go out to point to what the left and right hemisphere saw. So the left hand points to a shovel, the right hand to a chicken. So you say, ask the patient, why'd you do that? He looks at his hands and he says, well, I saw a chicken claw. So I pointed to the chicken and you need a shovel to clean out the shed. So that's the left hemisphere talking and it's making up a story looking at what the two fingers are pointing to uh, that makes his behavior make sense. The left hemisphere didn't see the snow scene. It just confabulated 
chicken and claw, uh, chicken and shovel to go with the uh, 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 snow scene. So the, the point is that what we concluded from this is that, you know, this is not a necessarily a consequence of having your brain split apart. It's something we all do every day, all the time, that what consciousness does for us is make sense of our lives. Uh, it's a high level kind of operation that allows us to um, tell stories that, that make everything make sense. It puts it all together for us. So uh, in the case of um, um, a um, split brain patient, you know, it's like making up a story based on unconscious information that's been generated behaviorally. But we, a lot of our behavior is generated unconsciously as well. And so at that night at the bar, we were chatting about all this and we were saying, well, you know, maybe what happens is that if you, you know, we all kind of believe we have some kind of free will or that we're in charge of at least some of the behaviors that we generate. So it can be kind of disturbing if you aren't in charge, you see yourself performing behaviors you aren't in charge of, and that maybe emotion systems are behaviors that might produce these kinds of behaviors um, sub, uh, non-consciously and require some kind of dissonance reducing uh, explanation. So Mike was a good friend of Leon Festinger's at the time and the theory of cognitive distance, which I guess you're at Stanford, right? So you know all about cognitive distance. I think that's where they discovered it at the time. Um, the, um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, that we, we produce these behaviors, cause dissonance, and we have to have some way to reduce the dissonance. And we do that by telling a story about why we did what we did. And, you know, you're having an argument with your, your uh, partner, let's say, and Often, um, this may ring, resonate with you, but sometimes you find that, you know, as the thing you're saying is coming out, you know it's not right, but it's too late. And so you either, you know, tell, you then start a narration where either you apologize or you stick with your guns. You know, it's just that kind of thing that's happening all the time. So, you know, I decided that what I wanted to do is um, study emotion and in particular, uh, brain systems that might operate non-consciously to control our behavior, our, our emotional behaviors, that in humans might cause these dissonance reducing narratives to spin up. Um, so that's why I turned to rats and Pavlovian conditioning and spent I don't know, 40 something years, maybe longer, um, uh, studying how the brain respond, detects and responds to danger. Okay, so I forget exactly, oh, we we're talking about self and so forth. So in self as a narrative, self as a story we tell about ourselves. All right. Then you asked about the four realms of existence. Um, so before we move um, on to the, that, I just, what I wanted to do, is, yeah, just to make sure that I uh, am following so far. So what came out of the split brain work was that our conception of the self is what arises out of this conscious narrating that helps us make sense of the world. Yes, yourself is a narration that you that's generated non-consciously by cognitive systems in your brain, putting a lot of stuff together. Um, um, and so I'm not, a, I, I think all of the stuff that's been discovered about as features of self and features of personality are important, but maybe these centuries old ideas that go all the way back to the ancient Greeks um, are not the best kind of uh, uh, concept or conception to hang all these facts upon. So what I wanted to do was to take all of this interesting and important stuff about who we are that's been discovered in the name of self and personality and repackage them into these four realms of existence. And that's, so that's what I did in the book. So the first realm is the biological realm. So the first realm is the biological realm. Everything that is living is a biological organism from the bacterial cell all the way through your cat and you and me and everything else that is living or has ever lived is a biological being. Now, some biological be whether it's a single cell or a multi-cell organism, some biological beings um, develop nervous systems and that isolates animals as a group from all of the rest of life. Only animals have nervous systems. Um, so you take a plant, it doesn't have a nervous system. It can communicate 
between its roots and its leaves. It can cause the leaves to, to move. It can, well, leaves can move into the sun or uh, other things. The roots can find, can behave by finding uh, liquids and, and nutrients, but those are very, very slow processes. A nervous system allows you to respond instantaneously to a stimulus. And that is the virtue of having a nervous system. You can move around in the world. You can respond to it very quickly. Um, and you, it's, it's very effective and efficient in avoiding danger and securing uh, nutrients to stay alive. So <clears throat> the, the nervous system, um, well, all of these realms I call, uh, I talk about as mere realms. For example, the neurobiological realm, the mere neurobiological means things that are only done neurobiologically. So for example, reflex, reflexes, habits, and other kinds of automatic behaviors, fixed action patterns, uh, instincts, these are all control as stimulus response events. There's no uh, internal representation, no cognition involved, no consciousness is involved. So that's what I mean by the mere neurobiological realm. It controls your heartbeat, your breathing rate, and sleep cycles, and, and all of that stuff non-consciously and non-cognitively. So uh, the cognitive realm, though, is, and the conscious realm are both a little different. There are no um, physical markers that we can use. Biologically, we know that an organism is a biological organism because all organisms are. So if it's alive, it's biological. Neuro neurobiological, we have the nervous system to tell us which organisms are neurobiological uh, beings because if they have neurons, then they have, they're neurobiological beings. Um, but with cognition and consciousness, it's a little different. Um, the, um, there are no you know, particular physical markers that unequivocally tell you this is cognition or this is consciousness. We have to use behavior. Now, when you use behavior, um, that means that you are using behavior to uh, identify whether some process is cognitive or not. But that means you need a concept of what it is you think cognition is. So different people have different ideas about cognition. For some, it's in information processing. So you get a lot of invertebrate researchers who say that, you know, a grasshopper or a bee has cognition because they process information in complex ways. But it, this gets to the AI argument as well. So does an AI bot have cognition or does it just have information processing? And I would say it just has information processing. So I don't, I don't go with that, that definition of cognition as information processing because it's just too broad. Uh, and cognition itself, though, we could talk about uh, Kenneth Crake, who um, in the 1940s came up with, I think, a very good definition of cognition, but he didn't call it that at the time. Uh, what he was talking about is how some animals, let's say mostly mammals, I would say, um, have in their head a little internal representation of the outside world. And they use that representation to make decisions and guide their behavior and, um, and survive in a way that is much more sophisticated than you can without having a mental representation that allows you to flexibly control your behavior. For example, the difference between a goal-directed behavior, which is flexible, and a habit, which is inflexible and just triggered by a stimulus, is that goal-directed behavior involves a mental model. Now, uh, Nathaniel Daw um, and colleagues in the, the 1990s borrowed a, uh, a concept or a way of talking from machine learning called um, uh, <clears throat> model-based and model-free learning. And so in model-free learning, you, have, you don't have a middle model, you just have these automatic processes. Whereas model-based learning, uh, you do have these internal representations. So for me, cognition is the use of internal representations to create mental models to control behavior. Um, and 
that's you know i think that's pretty straightforward it's i wouldn't think that that's controversial but some people would want a broader definition um but i think their broad definition gets subsumed within my mere neurobiological realm if you're just talking about information processing so you know that's why i like these these four realms because it does give us partitions very hard defined well-defined partitions of of behavior uh, behaviors that are merely neurobiological behaviors that are merely cognitive and some are conscious. So within, you know, one of the things I did in the cognitive realm was to take on the, uh, <clears throat> the topic of, you know, the Kahneman fast and, and slow thinking uh, process. Um, so Danny Kahneman, a Nobel prize winner, psychologist who won the Nobel prize in economics had this uh, two kind of friend, two system, cognition thing going where he talked about there are things that are very fast and things that are more deliberative and slow. So the, the, the fast system, uh, I guess that was system one for him, uh, <clears throat> is includes all kinds of processes that allow you to respond quickly. Uh, whereas the slow system requires working memory and it's more deliberative and internal involves mental models and so forth. Um, but I'm saying mental models. He didn't say that in, in his book. So um, the problem with that is a lot of the stuff in his um, system two, the, the slow one, can be broken up into two kinds of categories. One is um, conscious and cognitive. So it's, it's both conscious and cognitive. But the other is cognitive but not conscious. So when we talk about mental models, we're not talking about consciousness, we're talking about unconscious processes that can control goal-directed behavior, independent of whether or not those cross the consciousness finishing line and you're aware of what's going on. So we have a lot of complex behavior that we can do non-consciously, driving down the road and you know, thinking about something else. And then all of a sudden something jumps out and you like grab hold and, and take conscious control over it. Uh, but a lot of behavior can be controlled non-consciously through cognition. So I, I, what I do in the, in the book is to divide um, the, the uh, slow system into two systems. One is cognitive and one is conscious, but they're both cognitive, but sorry, but one of them is conscious and one is not. So we've got conscious and cognitive we have cognitive, but not conscious. So those, that's the top levels. Uh, then in the system one, the lower system that's fast, there are a lot of fast processes that are uh, just reflexive, automatic, and not cognitive. So we add a, a not cognitive, and um, uh, we add a, just a pure not cognitive category down there. But we can also have an, uh, a, a, an, a cognitive category that is separate from that reflexes. So you got reflexes, you got non-conscious cognition, then you have uh, con conscious cognition, and then you have consciousness. Those are the four categories. So we start from the top, consciousness, which is cognitive, non-conscious, but cognitive, cognitive, but not conscious down here, and then uh, automatic or not cognitive. So I, <laughs> that was a little confusing, I guess, but uh, those are the four categories that we can divide behavior into across all of, um, all of animals. So um, it, it allows you to say if a given behavior, it, it gives you some kind of guidepost for deciding whether a behavior is um, in the ballpark of cognition or not reflexes, anything that's habitual and reflexive is neurobiological and not in the cognitive realm. Cognitive realm responses are cognitive, they involve mental models, but they aren't conscious. And then into the, the conscious realm, we have uh, conscious processes that are cognitive, but you could also have some that are not cognitive. For example, uh, what, what some people call phenomenal consciousness or um, you know, or sentience and other things like that. 
Okay. Well, that no, that was not confusing at all. It was all great. There, I'll, I have a couple of anecdotes or comments to make, and then maybe we can we'll move on. But the first is that uh, Danny Kahneman was on the show uh, a few months or so ago, and it was one of my, I think, big failures as an interviewer because I had planned. On, he was great. But I had planned on interviewing him about thinking fast and slow. So that's what I read and, and prepared for. But then the day before or so, uh, he told me that he wanted to talk about noise, which is his book with Cass Sunstein. And I just didn't I didn't have time to prepare for it. And it was a pretty uh, in-depth book. And I sh- probably should have tried to re- tried to reschedule. Uh, but I did my best. I think it still came out pretty well. And I read the book afterward and it was great. But I, I yeah, I mean, if you have a new I book, mean, that's what you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not a book that you wrote 20 years ago. And I probably should have been thinking about it, but th- should have realized that. But I, I just wanted to ask about one detail of what you were saying, because it's a, a topic du jour and just interesting, even if it's orthogonal to the four realms but you said that you don't think of cognition as information processing and ais do not have cognition because cognition involves mental models but to me it seems like using the word mental is just precluding ai in itself since we don't think of ai as mental and then mental state language uh, is pretty contentious and vexed in itself but I can imagine an AI that does generate a couple of models and then select one that is more closely aligned with its goal. A self-driving vehicle seems like something that might be doing this. So I'm wondering if you have maybe more more of an explicit way of differentiating between information processing and cognition that might preclude what a self-driving vehicle is doing. Right. So, you know, I guess I can back off a little bit on, on what I said about that because, you know, I think the the biggest problem with AI is not cognition so much as consciousness. And and we can talk about that later. But, but I, you know, I think that you have very sophisticated information processing in AI. There's no doubt about that. And if... Um, if that is the, you know, we can probably call that cognitive, some of that cognitive. You can, they create probably internal machine models of the world and use those to reference. And, and so I'll back off on that and, and limit my concerns with AI with consciousness, um, if that makes sense. No, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. And in the end, uh, I think it's fair to say that cognition is just a word and it can mean whatever we want it to mean. Right, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But all these things to... are words, emotions, cognition, mind. Mm-hmm. Before we start at the beginning, because I'd like to start with the, the biological, I wanted to clarify. So it, this is not a theory. It's a framework. And the main purpose other than other than other than i mean clarifying some confusions around old and archaic terminology maybe that we've inherited like self and and personality so the framework gives us a way for categorizing all human behavior so we can label whether this is biological or neural or cognitive or conscious and this is more the purpose than trying to establish some hierarchy of reduction and argue that it's not an argument about whether consciousness is biological, even if that's what you believe, that's just not the purpose of this framework. Well, it's not the purpose of the framework, but I would definitely say it's biological. (laughs) I mean, I do say that in the book, so I'm not going to back off on that. 